church. Good to be with you this morning as we gather for worship. I'd like to direct your attention to the screen as I invite you to worship today. Come, let us worship the Lord. and his province, we've been called to this place for that great and glorious work that is worship. I'd like to invite you at this time to uh, greet uh, your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ warmly.
Please, I invite Amy Lucas to bring us our morning announcements. Good morning. Well, welcome to Beverly Heights Church. We're so happy that you're here with us this morning. And a special welcome to those of you who are visiting with us today. We're so happy that you're here with us to worship the Lord together on this Lord's Day. I do have a few announcements I'd like to bring to your attention. Um, Christian education for all ages is available at 10 a.m. Uh, we will be offering classes for our littlest ones all the way up through our senior high school students. And then our adults are welcome to join us in the social room for a class called Vignettes on the Life of Paul. And that's being taught by Dr. T. David Gordon, um, a retired professor from Grove City College. So we invite you to join us for that. Wednesday Night Heights is still off to a great start, and we hope that you'll be able to join us this week. If you haven't been able to join us yet so far, you're welcome to come for dinner on Wednesday. Our children start, come starting at 4 and have programming that runs until 545, and then our church family gathers at 545 for dinner together. If you are not on that distribution list to get an invitation from Jen Tan, I invite you to uh, call the church office or email either Jen or myself, and we'll make sure to get you on that distribution list. And our Scattered Seed Symposium is quickly approaching. It is one week from tomorrow. If you have not yet signed up, we still have space. Uh, the, tomorrow will be the very last day to sign up for the food portion. That portion of reservations will close tomorrow so that we can make sure we have all the preparations we need in order to have the uh, right amount of food for everyone. And, but the lecture portion will remain open up until um, the day of unless we fill. I don't think we'll fill completely the sanctuary. So we hope that you'll be able to join us and you can use the forms page of our website to sign up for that or feel free to send me an email and I can make that reservation for you as well. Thank you. If you, read, if you would, please direct your attention to the screen uh, and join me in our call to worship this morning. God chose his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. Let us pray. Gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time. What a blessing and a privilege to gather as his people for worship, to be united by you, common in our need and affection for you, to be a congregation, joining our hearts and our voices as one in proclamation of King Jesus, who reigns now and forevermore. We proclaim and we rejoice, and we offer you thanksgiving for your one and only Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who reigns not by commanding angels and summoning armies, but by coming down low, becoming human, humbling himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So help his Father to be shaped and to be formed like your Son, to be Christ-like, Help us to rejoice even in our sufferings, just as Jesus did, in order that we might have a hope that is secure and a faith that is strong, producing a worship that is honest and true from the whole heart, Lord, filled with adoration. Help us to be the church that is worthy of you, for it is in your name, for his name's sake we pray. Amen. <clears throat> I'd like to direct your attention this morning to our New Testament lesson, which is found in the book of Colossians, second ch chapter, verses 8 through 15, in which Paul writes, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. 
For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you've been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which, in which you were also raised with him through faith and the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. That scripture lesson is helpful to us as we prepare this morning to celebrate the sacrament of baptism. I have the great pleasure and honor of being able to invite uh, Brandon and Katie uh, Carabinos as they present their son, Liam Dale Carabinos, for uh, baptism. I'm getting to a place in my ministry where I'm starting to feel old because uh, Katie was in Holly's very first class uh, when she taught second grade as a newly minted teacher in 1999 at Jubilee Christian School. And uh, Katie and I and two other uh, girls from the class became lifetime friends because we went to the Pittsburgh Zoo together. I was a driver and a uh, chaperone for one of the um, field trips. And on the way home, I felt like going to Wendy's to get a Frosty. And uh, we all got Frosties, and uh, I became a legend that day. Uh, and I said uh, to all the girls in the back, don't tell anybody that we did this. And I think Katie kept the secret. Others were running their mouth, but Katie, <laughs> Katie stayed true. And so uh, it is a delight for me to, uh, to invite Brandon and Katie to come. Brandon and Katie have uh, been visiting with us for about a year or so now. They came in the midst of the pandemic. They're currently in the Inquirer's class and moving towards membership, and they want to also present uh, their son, um, uh, Liam, for baptism. So if you guys would come to the baptismal font. This is an important and significant, yes, right there, an important and significant event in the, the life and the ministry of the church, but also in uh, Brandon and Katie's life and uh, in Liam's life. And also, I want to I take a moment to uh, mention the significance of having Dale Murphy with us here today. Dale is, uh, is Liam's grandmother, and she has been on our prayer list for a number of months uh, over a year ago or so, uh, we were informed of her cancer diagnosis. Uh, but I'm delighted to be able to report to you, if you know, if you've had uh, cancer in the family, if you know how the treatment cycle goes, once you've uh, graduated from the treatment cycle, you have the opportunity to ring a bell. And that is a significant uh, moment in uh, the life of a, of a cancer patient. I had the privilege of being able to participate in that one time with a member of our congregation. And uh, Dale rang the bell on Friday. And so, yes. And so I am delighted that she's here with us and that we've had the privilege of being able to pray for you and sending you cards. And it is just a real, <laughs> she really rang the bell. <laughs> she was calling in dinner. All right. <laughs> well, Brandon and Katie, it is a delight to have you here and to present to your son, Liam, uh, for baptism. Placing this sign upon his life says something, as Paul says in Colossians chapter 2. It is a sign that speaks of the victory that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ and the victory that he achieved on the cross. It is a sign that speaks even to the principalities and the powers, even to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly place. And so this is not a small or insignificant thing. It is a weighty thing. 
as uh, we as a congregation have been introduced to the weightier matters uh, of the church in the recent Scattered Seeds newsletter, uh, speaking of, uh, of a child that was uh, baptized in the Light Princess, uh, this morning we are placing the waters of baptism on Liam's head, and we are giving him the sign of belonging to this covenant community. Baptism doesn't save a child. Baptism doesn't uh, cause the regeneration that saves a person's life. Baptism is a sign of covenant belonging, that Liam belongs to this church. Liam belongs to the covenant people of God. And we as a people have the privilege of partnering with these parents in praying for Liam that the Lord would touch his life and cause the sign, the waters of baptism, to be made real and valid in his life by faith. And that his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and all that Christ did on the cross would be made real and that his heart would be changed and that he would be a part of the kingdom of God. And so, as we prepare to place the sign of covenant belonging on Liam, I would ask you, mom and dad, to give assent to the following questions. Do you acknowledge Liam's need of the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ and the renewing grace of the Holy Spirit? Do you? And do you claim God's covenant promises and benefits for Liam? And by faith, do you look to the Lord Jesus Christ for the salvation of Liam as you do your own? Do you? And do you now unreservedly give Liam to God? And do you promise by relying on God's power and grace through the Holy Spirit to live an exemplary life before Liam? Do you? And do you commit yourself to pray with and for Liam, to teach Liam the scriptures and the great articles of our faith in Jesus Christ? Do you? And do you promise to use every means provided by God, including faithful participation in the life of the church, to bring Liam up in the loving discipline of the Lord? Do you? And since baptism is a partnership that is established by covenant promise, I would ask you, the members of Beverly Heights Church, the following questions. Do you, the members of this congregation, acting for yourselves, and on behalf of the whole body of Christ, Assume responsibility with these parents for the spiritual nurture of Liam. Do you? Do you commit yourself to set a godly example before Liam to provide as far as you are able all that is necessary to the end that Liam may one day confess Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord? Do you? All right, Liam. (laughs) The moment has come. Liam Dale Carabinos, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And we are delighted to have you as part of the family. Delighted to have your entire family here, the first three rows of the sanctuary. But that family now continues all the way back to the back row as we claim you as ours and we take on the responsibility, the privilege of praying for you, loving you, encouraging you, watching you grow up in this place, teaching you about Jesus and how much Jesus loves you, and we're delighted to have you. Friends, this is Liam Dale Carabinos. Would you bow your heads and your hearts with me now as we pray? Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this privilege of being able to gather together in this place in worship and to be able to receive Brandon and Katie and their family this morning, to be able to receive Liam, to be able to place the sign of covenant belonging upon his head and upon his life. He is now a marked man. Lord, I pray that that mark might permeate his entire life, that his life would be formed and conformed to the waters of baptism, that you would do so by grace, that it would remind him and each one of us that we all deserve death. Waters is a sign of death that covered the earth long ago as Noah's flood rised and covered the land of, of the earth. Lord, I pray that the waters of death by grace might be miraculously and graciously and powerfully turned into the waters of cleansing and life 
Because Jesus Christ took the death that was ours. He took it on the cross. And Lord, we now are reminded of that death and that life that comes to us by faith. And this sign, this covenant sign, this sign of promise reminds us of this and compels us to live in accord with the promise. I pray, Lord, that we as a church would be strong in encouraging these parents and encouraging Liam, helping them all to grow and Liam to grow more and more in the strength and the knowledge and the admonition of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, reach out to Liam by grace. Melt his heart even now as a young boy and continue to shape it and to mold it after the image of the Lord Jesus Christ so that one day we might hear a strong and good confession of faith to know, Lord, of his love for Jesus even as we love you. We give you thanks for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. It's good to have you on the team, Liam. I love the blue. (laughs) Friends, would you join with us now as we sing Jesus Loves Me.
to be loved with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. You are worthy to receive glory and honor and power, and you are worthy to be our source and our delight, worthy of the entirety of our trust, dependence, and devotion. Father, you are worthy of our lives, for we did not have a life, we were dead. But through his blood, we have been purchased and justified. We've been reborn and given new life. As you lay down yours, may we lay down ours. For our brothers and sisters, for your church. Father, we pray that these gifts, these tithes, let them be tokens of our very lives. Lives laid down, lives surrendered, lives given over to you, to your service, to your worship. For you are worthy, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, creator and ruler of all, and all God's people said. Please stand and join us for the doxology. We are continuing this morning in our sermon series in the book of Isaiah, directing our attention now to the latter half of Isaiah chapter 9 and to the beginning of Isaiah chapter 10. We're splitting the, uh, the chapters because the, the themes of the book, the themes that are being worked out are not divided uh, neatly by the, ch the chapters themselves. And so we want to make sure that we're keeping the themes together. And so those themes spread out over the chapters. And so we're looking at four paragraphs, actually, beginning in verse uh, 8 through chapter 10, verse 4. If you have your Bibles, I'd like to invite you to turn there with me or to take a pew Bible as we direct our attention now to the reading of God's Word. And as we do, I'd like to invite you to stand. The Lord has set a word against Jacob, and it will fall on Israel, and all the people will know, Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria, who say in pride and arrogance of heart, the bricks have fallen, but we will build with dressed stones. The sycamore has been cut down, but we will put cedars in their place. But the Lord raises the adversaries of resin against him and strips up, uh, stirs up his enemies. The Syrians on the east and the Philistines on the west devour Israel with open mouth. For all this, his anger has not turned away, and his hand is stretched out still. The people did not turn to him who struck them, nor inquire of the Lord of hosts, 
So the Lord cut off from Israel head and tail, palm branch and reed in one day. The elder and honored man is the head, and the prophet who teaches lies is the tail. For those who guide this people have been leading them astray, and those who are guided by them are swallowed up. Therefore the Lord does not rejoice over their young men and has no compassion on their fatherless and widows. For everyone is godless and an evildoer, and every mouth speaks folly. For all this, his anger is not turned away, and his hand is stretched out still. For wickedness burns like a fire, it consumes briars and thorns, it kindles the thickets of the forest, and they roll up upward in a column of smoke. Through the wrath of the Lord of hosts, the land is scorched, and the people are like fuel for the fire. No one spares another. They slice meat on the right, but are still hungry, and they devour on the left, but are not satisfied. Each devours the flesh of his own arm. Manasseh devours Ephraim, and Ephraim devours Manasseh. Together, they are against Judah. For all this, his anger is not turned away, and his hand is stretched out still. Woe to those who decree iniquitous decrees, and the writers who keep writing oppression to turn aside the needy from justice, and to rob the poor of my people of their right, that widows may be their spoil, and that they may make the fatherless their prey. What will you do on the day of punishment and the ruin that will come from afar? To whom will you flee for help, and where will you leave your wealth? Nothing remains but to couch among the prisoners or fall among the slain. For all this, his anger has not turned away, and his hand is stretched out still. Heavenly Father, as we come to your word this morning, we hear a strong word. We hear a word that speaks of the anger of God. And Lord, we are trusting you. We are hoping in you. We're asking you, Lord, to illuminate your word so that we might understand it and that we might receive it. Bless us, Lord, and help us today. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. The bow of God's wrath is bent and straining. The arrow is already set on the string. And justice aims it directly at your heart. It is nothing but the mere pleasure of God, an angry God, who is not restrained by any promise or obligation that keeps the arrow from being drunk with your blood. This means that all of you whose hearts have never been changed by the power of the Holy Spirit, who have never been born again and made new creatures, raised from being dead in sin to a new light and life, all of you are in the hands of an angry God. These are, of course, the sobering words of Jonathan Edwards in a sermon that he preached in Enfield, Connecticut, July 8th, 1741. Perhaps the most famous sermon ever preached by Jonathan Edwards. If anybody knows anything about Jonathan Edwards, They know perhaps that he was a theologian and a pastor who ministered in the New England area. But if they know him, they know him because of this sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. My first encounter with this sermon was actually not a theological seminary. I didn't read any of Edwards when I was studying for the ministry. I did not encounter uh, Edward's sermon when I was in undergraduate school 
and I was studying in the Bible department there at Geneva College. I actually did engage with Jonathan Edwards while studying at Geneva, but I did not read his famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. I first encountered this sermon in 10th grade in English class at Seneca Valley High School, which is a remarkable thing to consider. I was only at Seneca Valley for one year. You know, if you know a little bit about me, that I graduated from Mars Area High School, but I did spend one year at Seneca Valley because of some moving that we as a family did. And when I was there in 10th grade, as part of the English class, I was introduced to and expected to read and respond to Jonathan Edwards' sermon. It's remarkable for me to even think about that now that this would be found in a public school. I remember at the time having some significant difficulty with the text. I have a version now that's in modern English or made easier for reading, but when I read it in English class in 10th grade, I read it in the original, in the older English, and so I was struggling with the language, but I was also struggling with the themes. Sinners in a hand of an angry God? doesn't seem right. And so I took the text, the sermon, and I shared it with my mother, and my mother read the sermon, and we talked about it, and she was clearly and visibly upset by the sermon. She asked, where's the grace? Where is the mercy of God? Where is the love of God to be found in this text? This was a natural reaction, I think, by my mother and by others who encounter and reading this sermon. Certainly was probably the thoughts of some who heard the sermon for the first time. Where's the grace? Where's the mercy? Where's the love? It's a natural reaction to the idea of an angry God, but I suggest to you this morning that that's a natural reaction because our understanding of an angry God is far too human. An angry God is distasteful to us and to our sensibilities about who we think God is. Or we think think one of two things. We either think this cannot simply be who God is. God is supposed to be a God of love. God is supposed to be a God of charity. God is supposed to be a God of long-suffering and patience. He doesn't get angry. Or, on the other hand, we hear about an angry God, and it fulfills all of the caricatures that we have come to think about who God is. This angry, upset, vindictive, mean person up in the sky who's just looking for opportunities to judge And so we have these two extremes. God is only and always angry, or God is never angry, never upset with me. This happens because our view of anger or our view of God is too human. And so we need a biblically informed view of God, a biblically informed view of anger, And that's what we receive, exactly what we receive in the text. And so I turn your attention this morning to the big idea of the text. As we read these four paragraphs in Isaiah chapter 9, the latter part of 9 and the opening of chapter 10, we are reminded that God is a king. And God as the king, is he is holy. He is righteous. He is good. And his anger is, in fact, the predictable and appropriate response toward a disobedient people. God's anger is an appropriate response, in fact, a predictable response, if we understand the Scriptures, that God would have against those he loves. Because he loves his people, he's willing to get angry with them. Remember where we've come. 
We're looking at Isaiah chapter 7 through 12 as, a, as an entire literary unit. There was chapters 1 through 6 that dealt with a theme of God working with Judah and among the idols. And now we are in the kingdom of Emmanuel. Chapters 7 through 12, we're dealing with and considering God's kingdom, the kingdom of Emmanuel, the kingdom of God where God is with us. God is among his people. And what God is seeing and hearing among his people is upsetting to God. God is among his people. He's among Ahaz. Ahaz is the king of Judah. And Ahaz is looking at the political landscape, and he sees that there's trouble in the north. There's Assyria in the north. And not only Assyria, but there's their brothers in the flesh, Israel to the north, and Syria just off to the east a little bit. And they're looking at us, Syria, as well. And they're nervous, and they want to take over Judah. And take all of the riches and the wealth and the military might of Judah and to use them basically as a shield against Assyria. And Ahaz doesn't want to do it. He's thinking he can make a private and independent deal with Assyria. But God is among his people. And he says to Ahaz, trust me. God speaks through the prophet Isaiah to Ahaz, trust me, I am with you. I will hold you up. I will protect you. Ask for a sign. A sign of reassurance, a sign of my blessing, a sign of my presence and power among you. And Ahaz says, no. No, thank you. Ahaz does not trust in God. He is not established in faith. He rejects God's gracious offer for a sign of reassurance. And so God responds. He promises judgment and grace, as we considered last week. God is with his people. He's not going to abandon them. He's not going to forsake them. In fact, he's with them so much that he's going to take the judgment upon himself. But in our text for today, God also voices his displeasure. He's angry. There are four paragraphs in our text for this morning each of which ends with this phrase, this sentence, for all this his anger has not turned away and his hand is stretched out still. Four times, again and again and again, as much as I wanted to, try as I might, looking for another theme, another big idea in the text for us to consider, I could not ignore the drumbeat of what God was saying. For all this, his anger has not turned away, and his hand is stretched out still. God is angry with a disobedient people. So what does that mean? Well, we must define anger. We need a biblical understanding of anger. If we look to the dictionaries, we find a definition that looks and sounds similar to this. This is from the American Heritage Dictionary, one that I find to be quite helpful. They define anger in the following way. Anger is a feeling of great displeasure or hostility towards someone or something caused by a sense of injury or wrong. Anger is a displeasure. It's a sense of hostility against someone or something who has caused injury, harm, or wrong. Now, there's a measure of connection here. We can see a little bit of anger as it's defined here in in our text for this morning. This applies at some level. God has, he is upset. There is a displeasure toward a people who have caused an injury. Disobedience is injurious to God. Why? Because he is the maker of all things. He is the ultimate. He is in charge. He is the king. And disobedience is an injury against his holiness, against his sovereignty. And he responds to it. But when we think of anger, that's not the only thing we think of, this feeling of displeasure. When we think of anger, sometimes our mind goes to this idea of retaliation. 
We've known those who have been angry with us, and they have turned toward us, and they have responded in kind with a certain measure of retaliation in their anger. They've gotten us back. We've all been the victim of that, and we wonder, well, how does this apply to God? Does it even apply to God? Is God somebody who retaliates? Is he looking to get us back? We think of anger, and we think of hostility, verbal, even physical aggression toward individuals, toward property that results in damages, anger that becomes violent. Perhaps you've been a victim of such anger or such violence. Can this possibly apply to God? Is, is God violent? When we think of danger, uh, anger, we think of something that can be dangerous, destructive. But is God in any of these things? Is this the kind of anger that God exhibits? If anger is indeed problematic, if it's dangerous then we do need Aristotle's instruction about anger. Remember Aristotle, don't you? Man of antiquity, man of wisdom and great learning, a disciple of Plato, wrote about ethics and ethical behavior, someone who reflected powerfully and pondered upon this whole idea of anger. He said something about anger that has reverberated throughout history and comes to us today still is wisdom. Aristotle said, anybody can become angry. Right then and there, you know that Aristotle's a genius. Anybody can become angry. That is easy, Aristotle says. But to be angry with the right person and to the right degree and at the right time and for the right purpose and in the right way that is not within everybody's power and is not easy. Anybody can become angry, that's easy, but to be angry with the right person, to the right degree, at the right time, and for the right purpose, and in the right way, that is not within everybody's power and is not easy. But it is within God's power. It is within grasp for God. God is angry with the right person and to the right degree and to the right time and for the right purpose and in the right way. And he expresses that anger perfectly. Anger is powerful. It has the potential to cause great harm. And great care needs to be taken to safeguard against the destructive power of anger. Because we're not like God. We wield and yield anger in a different way in a sinful way. I remember when I was studying at, uh, at seminary and I was working a part-time job at Enterprise Rent-A-Car, I had the, the privilege, really, of working with a cohort of men and women who were all retired. A lot of folks who were retired and looking to earn a few bucks and get it out a couple days of the week to do some work would take jobs driving cars for Enterprise Rent-A-Car. And it was a helpful job to me because the hours were very flexible and I could always work it around my schedule as I was taking classes at Trinity School for Ministry. And I spent a lot of hours with these men and women in cars and stories would come out. And I remember the time when there was a, uh, a gentleman who was within our cadre of uh, drivers. Everybody had a nickname. They called me the chaplain because they knew I was going to seminary. And this other gentleman who was in the car, we called him Jimmy the Greek. And he was, a, he was Greek. And I can't remember his last name. It was Constantinople or something like that. Jimmy the Greek was telling a story about being in a funeral. And walking up to the casket and looking at the deceased and looking at the hands of the deceased and saying to himself, those hands will never hurt me again. Hand that was raised in anger, perpetrated against someone smaller, weaker, younger, 
Anger can be dangerous. And so we struggle with anger. And how in the world can this be a part of God's good and holy and perfect character? Is there no positive conception of anger? We must go to the scriptures. We hear Paul writing in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25 through 27. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. And do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. There are prohibitions here, but not against anger. Be angry and sin not, a prohibition against sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger, a prohibition against letting anger continue without a termination point, but not a prohibition against anger. Jesus seems to be one who in his earthly ministry exhibit a certain amount of anger. As he went into the temple... And he saw that God's house had been turned into something entirely different than what it was designed to be. And he said no. Zeal consumed him. He turned over the tables. And he drove out the money changers. I have been blessed and helped quite a bit by, again, church father in the early church, one I've mentioned before, John Chrysostom, he was the one who said, the same sun that melts wax hardens clay. You remember me talking about that just a week ago or so. Chrysostom has this to say about angry, or anger. He who is not angry, whereas he has cause to be, sins for unreasonable patience is the hotbed of many vices. It fosters negligence and incites not only the wicked, but the good to do wrong. What is Chrysostom saying here? If you have a cause to be angry and you don't, if you have a righteous and appropriate and necessary cause that should elicit a response in you and saying this is not right and you don't say that, you are sinning. And if you're engaging in patience, an unreasonable patience will cause not only the wicked to go astray, but the good. And we must be willing as members of the body of Christ to say, this shall not stand. We will go no further with this. This has to stop. And anger encourages us to do that. Our text makes reference to both anger and wrath. The word anger is a reference to the nose, actually. In the Hebrew, it's an idiom that makes reference to the nose or a nostril flare or a heavy breath. You've all heard dad come in and see the state of your bedroom and say, he goes, ah! God is saying, ah! Why is he saying, ah! Because he is communicating with us. Anger is responsive. It's God's means of telling us, this is not good. We shouldn't be here. This will lead to danger. This will lead to your destruction. No. Wrath is a reference to a burning fire that overflows and sweeps away. Wrath is a fire that melts. It melts away unrighteousness. It melts away the hardened hearts. Wrath works in concert with grace. This idea of wrath is really a continuation of the fire theme that we saw just last week when we read Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1. There will be no gloom for her who is in anguish. There will be no gloom for her who are in the constraints of being melted down and recast and reformed and refashioned and remade into the image of Christ. Wrath is God's power to melt us down in order to remake us into who he wants us to be. 
And so let me suggest to you the following biblical definition of godly anger. Three things to consider. First, God's wrath and anger is a function of his love. God's wrath is God's motivated love that motivates God to make changes in a fallen world and in our sinful lives. When God steps out in anger or speaks in anger, he is actually stepping out in love, motivated love. God's wrath and anger is a revelation of God's humility. Wrath is God's willingness for God to get involved in our lives because we matter to God. If God didn't care, he'd just let us go. He would just let us run into the street and get hit by the car, and he would never cry out, Stop! But he's willing to get involved because he loves us, and he's willing to humble himself and to engage with sinful men and women. God's wrath and anger is God's gracious communication of God's holiness. God voices through his anger his priorities and his standards for his creation and for his people. This is biblical anger. This is wrath. Isaiah is giving an account of four quadrants of disobedience that God is angry about. The four paragraphs outline four quadrants of disobedience from a wicked heart, an unyielded will, a disordered community, and an unjust culture. God is angry at wicked hearts. That is to say that God is angry about pride. If you look at the text... Go back, verses 10, uh, 8, 9, and 10. The Lord has sent a word against Jacob, and it will fall on Israel, and all the people will know Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria, who say in pride and in the arrogance of heart, it's all fine, it's good, we're going to make it work. In fact, we're going to build back better. This is pride. Self-confidence saying, I'm in charge. Pride that is an allusion to the rising of the self. When God says that he's angry against pride, he's angry about men and women who raise themselves up, the raising of our hand to take the fruit and say, I know best, I'm going to eat. Pride that raises the hand and says, let's gather together bricks and mortar and let's build a tower all the way up to heaven and let's pull God down and raise ourselves up, and we'll be in charge. Pride that rises up, sin by a high hand, it seeks to crash down on our neighbor. Sin, pride, and also arrogance. Those who consider themselves great, consider themselves wiser and smarter than others, who know for themselves what is best, And they're happy to tell you about it. I know what's going on. I know what's right. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to make this work. We're going to succeed. Pride and arrogance. God is angry against pride and arrogance. Those who are proud in their hearts and unyielded in their will. God is angry against those who are unresponsive to discipline Look at verse 13. The people did not turn to him who struck them. This is a disobedient child who even when they've been met with loving discipline say, I don't care, I'm doing it my own way. These are unrepentant people who do not respond to the loving discipline of God. In fact, they'll say by receiving that discipline, you're upsetting me. You're hurting me. You're doing violence against me. 
you're in the wrong. An unyielded will, where anger is being shown by God against leaders whose leadership represents the interests of an unyielded people rather than the will of God. God is angry against those who fail in their role. God is going to cut them off. Those who seek to have authority and they accommodate the people rather than trying to please God. As I was reading this quadrant, as I was reading this paragraph, I was searching my heart and my soul. Oh, Lord. I hear you. I don't want to raise your anger. I want to be obedient. God is angry against those who lead and guide the people of God astray. Oh, Lord, let that not be me. God is angry against those who claim to speak for God, but speak folly instead, disgrace themselves. God is angry against a wicked heart, an unyielded will, against a disordered community, a community that is characterized by sin. God is angry against the power of sin. If we look at verses 18 through 21, we see what sin looks like. Wickedness that burns like a fire. It consumes briars and thorns. It kindles the thickets of the forest. Sin is like a wildfire that is spreading throughout a community. Tearing a community apart. And God sees it and he is wounded and he is hurt by it. And he says, this should not be. God is angry when he sees sin racking a community and a family. I've seen sin do this before. In other families. Even within our own congregation. My response has been oftentimes sadness and brokenheartedness, but God gets angry and says, no, this ought not be. We're going to get involved. God is angry against the sin that creates a devouring appetite within a community. People start slicing each other off like meat in order to satisfy their own desires God is angry against the community that looks to its own interests rather than the interest of God and then their neighbor who say, do unto others before they do it unto me. God is angry against a community that pursues self-gratification, a community that says, I've got to look out for me and for mine. Everything else can wait. God is angry against a culture of injustice. God is angry at a culture of unrighteousness that develops its own commandments rather than submitting to the commandments of God. Chapter 10, verse 1, Woe to those who decree iniquitous decrees and the writers who keep writing oppression. This is how we're going to do things. This is our policy. Obey it. Commandments that are contrary to the commandments of God. Woe to them who decree iniquitous decrees. Woe to any organization or institution that says, you must do this first before you can be a worshiper. You must be circumcised first before you can enter into the temple. God says, no. That's not right. I'm getting angry. God is angry at a a culture of injustice that ignores the needy, that ignores those who are without means to help themselves, ignoring those who have fallen low and below the least, the last, and the lost. God is angry against anyone who lacks the humility to engage with others who we find lower than ourselves and walk by day after day as the Pharisee walked by Lazarus, even as the dogs were licking his sores, saying, I don't see that. I don't see that. God is angry. 
God is angry against a culture of miserliness, against those who trust in their wealth and hoard their wealth for themselves. Where will you give your wealth, God says? To whom will you flee for help? And where will you leave all that money? All four of these quadrants, they together mark the four corners of a life of disobedience, a wicked heart, an unyielded will, a disordered community, a culture of injustice. And as we look at these four quadrants, if we can find anywhere in those four quadrants a place where we can put an X, a place where we can put a mark, if we participate in any of these, then we must conclude that God is angry at us. I wish we could get around this. I wish I didn't have to tell you this. I wish I could speak a word of hope and peace and grace and not of anger. But it's important. God has compelled those who speak for him to speak the truth. God is angry against these things. Against all these things, God's anger has not turned away and his hand is stretched out still. God is holy. But God says, I'm going to get involved. This is not right what's going on, but I'm going to humble myself and I'm going to start to get involved. God is loving and so he's motivated to make changes. And so he begins to melt our hearts, our disobedient hearts. And it is a good thing for sinners to fall in the hands of an angry God. What are we going to do? How do we respond to God's anger? Well, it depends on how we see his anger. Remember David sitting on his throne, feeling pretty good about how things were going. He just had a big problem that came up in his life, but he handled it pretty well. It was kind of messy, but got through that. Now that's behind us. There's a prophet in the land. His name is Nathan. He walks up to David and he says, I want to tell you a story, David. It's a story of a man in Judah. This poor man, doesn't have much, but he has this little lamb. He loves it. Cares for it. Eats at his table. Sleeps in his bed. He doesn't have any children. It's like a child to him. He'd give anything for this little lamb. One day, the neighbor, a wealthy neighbor, a well-established and full neighbor, filled with the good things of this world, had some out-of-town guests coming, David. And he needed to put dinner on the table for his guests, a fairly substantial and large party that was coming. And He needed to make preparations, and he said, what are we going to serve these people? We should serve lamb. And so he goes to his poor neighbor, and he rips that little lamb out of his hands, slaughters it, cooks it, and serves it. David gets angry. He's furious at what he's hearing. He's a shepherd king who knows what it means to care for the flock. And he's angry at the injustice of what has just happened. Who is this man? His head will not remain on his shoulders this day. And what does Nathan say? You are the man. And the whole thing breaks open. And the anger causes David to see 
His eyes are opened. God uses the anger in order to open David's eyes and open his heart and for him to confess, I am the man. I am the one who has committed such injustice. I am the one who has sinned against God with a high hand. I am the one who deserves death. So the anger leads to contrition, and contrition leads to repentance. God, have mercy on me. Don't be angry with me. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Forgive me. And so we ask the question, is there mercy still? Jonathan Edwards was not a stern or fiery or forceful preacher. That's a caricature of him based upon this one sermon. He actually ends the sermon with a tender gospel appeal. And on that day, when he preached this sermon in Enfield, Connecticut, roughly 500 people were converted after hearing that sermon. Edward says, now you have an extraordinary opportunity. This day, Christ has thrown the door of mercy wide open and stands calling and crying out with a loud voice to poor sinners like you and me. Many are flocking to him and pressing into his kingdom. They are coming daily from the east and the west, from the north and the south. Many who until very recently were in the same miserable condition that you are in. They are now happy, their hearts filled with love for him who has loved them and washed them from their sins in his own blood. How awful it would be to see so many people rejoicing and singing with joy from their heart while you can do nothing but mourn and feel sorrow in your heart and cry because your spirit is so afflicted. How can you rest for a moment if you are now in that condition? How can you rest knowing that we are in the hands of an angry God? Anger which is born of love Anger that has been satisfied in Christ. Anger that can be removed if we obey and trust in him. Today is the day. Today is the day. Today is the day in which we say, I am in your hands, Lord. Save me. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you that because you went to the cross, the wrath of God is satisfied. Every sin on him was laid there in the death of Christ. And because he died for me, I can live. Help me, Lord, today to run to you to run and not wait, to run and not tarry, to run and to see the hands of an angry God turned outward toward me, to see that they are pierced and that there is mercy still. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please stand and join us as we sing.
peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no man evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all men and women. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of you. Today, tomorrow, until Jesus comes again, and then indeed it shall be forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. There is nothing greater than the people of God joining together for worship on the Lord's Day. We're so very glad that you have been with us this morning on our live stream. We started our live stream ministry a number of years ago to serve those who could not be with us in residential worship. Here at Beverly Heights Church, we place a high value on worship. We believe that God has called us to gather by his love for us each and every Lord's Day. If you are close to us here in the greater Pittsburgh region, I want to personally welcome you and invite you to come and join with us in residential worship if you find yourself able. For those of you who may be joining us this morning who are not in the greater Pittsburgh region, I wanna encourage you to consider finding a local church where you can worship on the Lord's Day. You could even consider going to the EPC's website where they have a church locator to help you find a local church home. God bless.